So hello everyone. Welcome to our webinar today on teaching young learners. Um, my name is Mairead and I'm in Ireland. Um, I've been teaching for a long time now, um, nearly 20 years, and I've been lucky enough to uh, to work all over the world and work with students from, from pretty much every country you could imagine. Um, I've also taught a, a pretty wide range of ages, um, including lots of young learners. So hopefully um, we'll have lots to discuss in today's webinar. Um, so just out of interest, why don't you pop in the chat box where you're watching from? Um, it's always really exciting to see um, where everyone is tuning in from. Um, in the meantime, though, let's get started and I'll keep an eye on the chat box to see where you all are. All right. Um, so as we said, today's webinar is all about teaching young learners. Um, I guess the most logical thing to do um, would be to start with a definition of what is a young learner? Okay, what's the age group that it refers to? Um, young can be pretty, pretty subjective, right? Um, so um, normally when we talk about young learners, um, we're referring to students typically up to 16 years old. Um, now, this is a bit controversial because some people think that young learners um, refers to students up to 12, okay, whereas others will define it as up to 16. Um, we're going with up to 16 today, but, you know, if you see that it's only up to 12, don't be surprised either. Um, so we tend to have our young learners and we have another subcategory. Um, which would be very young learners. Um, typically, very young learners would be between the ages of three and six. Okay, so they tend to be like their own, <laughs> their own subcategory, because again, that's completely different, teaching the very, very young learners, as opposed to, you know, the, the seven years old and up. Um, when you are talking about students in their teens, like once they hit 13, um, you know, they are still young learners, but we would tend to just refer to them as teens, okay, teaching teens, um, because, yeah, as you all know, they are also their own very <laughs> special category, <laughs> okay. Um, so today uh, we're going to be mainly talking about, like, genuine young learners, so in between the ages of, say, 7 and 12, okay. But, you know, everything we say can be applied um, in some degree to the very young learners and to the teens. All right. Um, so yeah, if you've any questions about anything that I say, you know, write that question down because at the end, we're going to have a nice long Q&A session, okay, where you can ask anything you want about young learners. Um, oh, wow. Oh, okay, we have people from everywhere. So, hey, Jennifer. Um, Good to be on the same island as one of you, for sure. Um, we have Oman, Pittsburgh, oh, Sue. I've heard the US is having like the craziest winter. So I hope you're keeping warm. Um, we have Johannesburg, oh, lovely. Lovely and warm, I bet. Um, hey, Mena from Egypt. Oh, I'm jealous of the sun. And hey, Kathy. Um, I was taking your tips, Kathy, on baking lots of cookies and, and staying warm. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the worst of the, the cold weather has passed here. Um, so great to see you all today. Okay, so let's jump in then. Um, as you can well imagine everyone, um, young learners um, have very different characteristics to older learners, okay? They are a very, very different kettle of fish. Um, when we think of teaching young learners, um, bear in mind that young learners are not necessarily beginners. Um, sometimes when we think about teaching kids, we imagine that they have no English because they're young. OK, but that is not the truth. Um, we can have intermediate young learners. We can even have advanced young learners. OK, so try not to fall into the trap of thinking that just because they're young learners, they're going to be beginners because that is not the truth. Um, very young learners, the three to six year olds, um, you know, they tend to just learn through playing and singing songs. OK, um, we tend to just want to expose them to as much English as possible rather than sit them down and, and teach them stuff. OK, 
So we're, we're aiming for exposure more than anything with the very young learners. Um, with the young learners, so the, the ages maybe seven to 12 or six to 12, um, exposure is also super important, but we can start introducing a degree of um, formal learning. You know, they can sit down and do a worksheet or they can, you know, sit down and read a text and answer questions. Okay. And the really good thing about young learners is that they can practice all four skills to some degree. So you can start with the, the speaking, the listening, yeah, the, the reading and writing. Okay. Um, I think reading and writing is the real difference between the very young learners and the young learners. All right. So you can definitely have a little bit more variety when you hit the young learner stage. Um, so as I said, teaching young learners is a whole other ball game <laughs> to teaching adult learners. Um, let's talk about why. Um, young learners have a much shorter attention span. OK, um, I think this is the understatement of the decade. <laughs> um, they can't focus on one thing for too long. OK, their brains just aren't wired that way yet. OK. Um, young learners are far more energetic, okay, um, whereas your adult students are happy to sit there and just take it in, you know, young learners, not so much, okay, they need to be moving at all times, it seems. Um, young learners are much more emotional, okay, they are likely to express big emotions, okay, everything is extreme, okay, extreme excitement, extreme um, energy, yeah, extreme happiness. Um, but also, you know, sometimes they cry, sometimes they get extremely angry, sometimes they get extremely sad. Okay. So don't be alarmed if if you if you get a lot of emotion coming from your young learner class. That is totally normal. Um, young learners are more in need of entertainment. Okay. So when we're planning our lessons, we've got to try and build in fun stuff. You know, um, that's not to say that the entire lesson needs to be a sequence of, you know, games, fun. Yeah, um, we don't want to go to that extreme either. But, you know, do try to build in some some periodic fun <laughs> um, into your lesson. Um, young learners, I find they're far more demanding of attention and praise. OK, they want to know that you've noticed them um, doing something good. Um, even sometimes doing something bad if they feel that they're not getting enough attention. You know, they may they may act out slightly just to get some. Um, so yeah, be very be very generous with your attention and with your praise. Okay, where warranted. Um, I would also say that young learners are less self motivated. Okay, um, you know, whereas your adult students will think, okay, I'm paying for this class. This is my chance to improve. Let me very consciously focus. Um, kids, not so much. OK, um, they will work hard, but they will generally do it for attention, for praise or for reward. OK, so bear that in mind. The psychology is completely different. Um, bearing all these things in mind um, is really important when you plan your lessons. Um, when it comes to classroom management or keeping control of your class or setting up your class in a way that's conducive to learning, um, there are certainly a couple of things you can do, okay, to ensure that your, your classroom runs smoothly. Um, I would say everyone with your learners, the most important thing is to establish classroom rules very early on. OK, um, we've got to go in with the plan um, because if any of you have ever worked with kids or if you have kids yourself, um, you will know that kids will push the boundaries. Yeah, they will test you if they find any little loophole at all. <laughs> they are going for that loophole. OK, um, not out of any malice. <laughs> yes, certainly not. It's just the way they're wired, you know, their their brains are developing. They're they're just wired that way to try and push boundaries and try to get away with um, as much as they can. 
Um, so we've got to establish our classroom rules like immediately in the first class. OK, um, the longer we try to um, impose some rules, the harder it will be. OK, so I know it sounds like very strict and maybe a tad draconian, <laughs> but um, trust me, we want to get in there with our rules. OK, from the very first class. Um, the best way to establish the rules, I find, um, is to make a classroom contract with your young learners. OK, so get a nice big sheet of paper and um, put it up on the board and, you know, ask your learners, include them in the process. Um, ask them, what do you think um, I want you to do in this class or or how do you think we should behave in this class? OK, um, because believe me, kids know the rules. OK, they already know what they're meant to do. <laughs> okay, so when we're doing the classroom contract, um, we want them to tell us in as far as is possible. Um, so, you know, you'll have all of the usual rules like um, please speak in English, okay? Um, put your hand up if you want um, to ask a question, okay? Um, be nice to each other, okay? Uh, do your best. Yeah. You know, all the universal rules of any classroom anywhere in the world. OK, that's what we want to establish. Um, when you're talking about rules, um, it's really important that you tell them what to do rather than what not to do. Um, it's just a very interesting thing psychologically, like, um, you know, instead of telling your kids, don't speak Spanish or don't speak um, Arabic. Yeah. Instead of saying that, tell them what to do. So speak English. OK, speak in English with the teacher or speak in English with your classmates. All right. Um, or, you know, instead of saying don't um, speak when the teacher is speaking, you know, frame it differently, such as listen to the teacher or raise your hand if you have a question. OK, um, it seems like a small point, but believe me, it makes a massive difference um, telling the, your young learners what to do rather than what not to do. OK, um, and then, of course, you can add in any other rules that, that the kids don't say that you want to be on the contract. OK. So um, I always had a rule, for example, um, take off your jackets and put them on the back of your chair when you come to class. Um, because otherwise, you know, the kids were coming in and they were wearing their big jackets and, you know, we'd start the class and they'd be like moving their arm and their jacket would sweep everything off the table and it should just be carnage. <laughs> so, you know, once you've elicited all the rules that you want, you know, you can absolutely add in your own then. OK, um, because it's a contract, um, once you have all of the rules written out, um, sign it. OK, you make a big show of signing the contract as the teacher. OK, like you are going to uh, follow the rules, too. And then just invite the kids up. Yeah, let them pick a nice colored marker and, uh, you know, the, everybody can sign the contract on the bottom. OK. Um, kids take that su super seriously, <laughs> okay? And as the time passes, if, you know, one of your learners does something that breaks the rule, all you need to do is point to that contract on the wall and say, oh, remember, you signed this. Yeah, you said that you would speak English, okay? So, you know, it just gives you a, a little bit of extra leverage <laughs> when it comes to reminding them to follow the rules. Um, the contract is like a living thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a living organism. Um, so if you find that, you know, in week two or in week three, a new problem arises, you know, by all means, add the rule to the contract. OK, it's not like it's set in stone on the first day. OK, you can add things in. Um, if something stops being an issue, yeah, you can cross it out. OK. Um, you can have a little crossing out ceremony 
Um, I used to do this with my kids all the time. I'd bring them up to the contract and they would each um, scribble out one letter, like they'd cross out one letter um, or they'd transform the letters into little pictures or something. Um, it was really nice for them to just like get rid of a rule because they were behaving so well. Um, that said, if it becomes an issue again, by all means, re-add it. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, just keep the contract relevant. Um, keep it ever changing. Um, if new kids join your class during the year, you know, let the older students, um, the students who've been there since the beginning of the year, explain the contract. Okay, just give them as much ownership over it as you can. Um, when it comes to um, applying the rules and, you know, keeping that discipline in the classroom, um, it's really important that you're consistent and that you are very fair. Um, as you, any of you who have worked with kids or have kids know, kids are very into fairness. Okay, and you know, they get very offended and very angry if they feel like they're not being treated fairly, um, which is absolutely great. I mean, you know, but we want to encourage that. We want them to uh, to expect fairness. Um, so, yeah, just, you know, avoid treating um, individual learners differently. OK, you know, it's hard sometimes. There are students that we're more drawn to than others, but we can never let that show. OK, we've got to be consistent. We've got to be fair. Um, if you can focus more on good behavior than bad. OK, um, again, psychologically, um, it's far more favorable for the kids to uh, to want to behave well. OK, um, so if you see anything that they're doing really well, you know, praise them for it and say, I notice. Yeah, I saw you sitting down quietly doing your coloring. OK. I saw it and I noticed and you did really well. Um, you know, we want them to want to behave well. OK, um, over time, praising good behavior um, can be far more effective than punishing bad behavior. OK, um, when it does come to bad behavior, though, you know, it happens. Kids are kids and with all the best will in the world, um, sometimes they can step out of line. Um, so it's really important that you are clear, that you are crystal clear on the consequences you can apply to bad behavior. OK. Um, so what I mean by this is before you start um, teaching in a, if you're teaching in a school, for example, before you start, um, you know, talk to your director of studies and find out what are you allowed to do if you need to um, to address bad behavior. You know, some schools will allow you to send the, the misbehaving child to another classroom for 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, other schools will not. OK, some schools will allow you to send the child to the secretary's office or to the director's office, um, but other schools will not. OK, um, some schools will let you um, give your kids extra homework or do lines as punishment. Um, some will not. Um, that said, though, I would never use homework as punishment. OK, <laughs> um, they already have enough of a, a negative attitude to, towards homework. We don't want to turn it into even extra punishment. Um, you know, some schools will have rules on contacting parents. OK, like if a child does something, um, you know, very disruptive in class, are you allowed to call the parent or do they have like a warning system where the kid needs to misbehave like two or three times before you can call the parents? OK, this is all stuff okay, that you have got to get clear in advance um, because we can absolutely not tell the kids that something will happen um, if we can't enforce that thing. OK. Um, in terms of um, consequences I used to use all the time, um, I used to, uh, well, at the beginning, let me explain the process. Um, at the beginning of class, um, I used to write all of the learners' names down the side of the board. Or if they were tall enough and if they could write well, um, they would just come in and write their own name down the side of the board. OK, um, then I would draw a circle next to each name. OK, 
and then begin the class. Yeah, do our normal things. Um, so if a child um, did something disruptive that caused me to stop the class to address, um, to address it, um, to address the behavior, um, then I would say, you know, oh, I noticed you're talking a lot today, um, Matteo. Um, remember what we said about um, not speaking when the teacher is talking. Okay, so we tell them verbally that we've seen it. And then I would write, I would draw like a little dot in the circle next to Matthew's name. Okay. Um, so it's kind of like a visual reminder that, you know, they have been noticed um, being disruptive. Um, then if Matthew did something um, disruptive again, you know, I would stop and I would tell him again, like Matteo, remember I told you um, that you should listen when the teacher is speaking, um, you know, please no, please remember, listening ears, Matteo. <laughs> and then I would put another circle in, uh, another dot in Matteo's circle. Okay, and then if it happened one more time, if there was a third incidence of disruption from Matteo, um, I would draw like a little, a little frowny mouth, like a little downward mouth. And, you know, Matteo would know that he'd, he had been corrected now three times. And whatever consequence I had in mind would happen. Okay, so I would say, "Oh, Matteo, look, you have you have three, um, you know, you have three strikes now, or you have your little sad face, and um, you know that means that you will have to sit and um, study while the rest of us are playing a game at the end of class." Okay because there's always a game at the end of class that's just how it is <laughs> the five last five ten minutes is always something fun um, and missing that game is like disaster for your young learners um, so that's a really useful consequence to have yeah because you misbehave three times yeah you don't get to do the fun thing at the end um, I found that this system worked really well because the students had loads of opportunity to correct themselves. Yeah, like Matteo could have stopped after he got his first circle or his first dot. He could have stopped after he got his second dot. Okay, um, And you'll find that kids, you know, once they know that you know what they've done and they have one dot on their circle, um, you know, they can self-correct. And that's ideal. Um, you know, that's why we that's why I like the little visual representation. OK, and the three chances before they they get their consequence. Um, so, yeah, that system worked pretty well for me. Um, of course, we can preempt nearly, I'd say, 90 percent of the disruptive behavior um, just by keeping our young learners attention, OK, by keeping them engaged, because a busy young learner is a happy young learner <laughs> and uh, not such a disruptive young learner. Um, I would say that when you're planning your um, lessons, variety is key, okay? We want to plan loads of tasks, okay? Keep them short and sweet. Um, it could be that the task only lasts 10 minutes, okay? And you have maybe, if the class is 60 minutes long, you have six different activities planned for it, okay? Just keep them short and sweet. Um, it's much, much better to end a task while students are still having fun than to let it run on and fizzle out. OK, you know, once we we think that the task has achieved what it needs to achieve, you know, stop it. Don't let it go on and fizzle. OK, because that's when um, disruption happens. Um, try to play lots of games. OK, but ensure that the games are purposeful. OK, so they're not just playing for the sake of it. All right. Um, it has a point um, like maybe it's a vocabulary game. OK, um, I'll share some of them with you in the end. I'm sure in questions and answers you'll have. I'm sure all of you will have a question asking for games. And um, so we'll talk about that later. Um, also, when you're planning your tasks, use young learners natural imagination and creativity. OK, you know, we want to just make the most of that enthusiasm for everything, okay? Whether it's miming, whether it's drawing, whether it's singing, okay? Um, whether it's making up stories, um, whether it's listening to really fun stories, okay?
okay you know use use all of those um all of those natural um characteristics that young learners have for fun for play and for imagination okay um try to change the task dynamic often okay so don't have the kids sitting at their desks for for too long okay you know try to mix up the tasks between sitting down standing up moving around working in pairs working in groups working individually okay you know just keep the keep the variety okay that's what will keep the young learners engaged um i find it works really well too to try to alternate quiet tasks with noisy tasks okay so if you have a task um that involves um you know sitting down and doing a matching worksheet great you know let them sit there for their 10 minutes or however long and then the next task try to give them something a little bit more active maybe more creative maybe you know singing maybe getting up and moving around and dancing okay you know just keep that dynamic varied um if possible if your classroom is big enough um try to have a designated play space and a designated workspace um i know not all classrooms will be big enough yeah but if you do have one where like all the tables and chairs are one side and then there's like an empty space on the other side, you know, it can be really helpful. Like at the tables and chairs, we work, okay? Um, at the other side of the classroom, we play. Even though, you know, they think it's playing, it is playing, but it's educational playing, hopefully. Um, and if you can, if you have a really long task, like a longer worksheet or writing or a long reading text, um, try to leave that for homework um, if your school um, gives homework, okay? Um, you know, of course, you can do reading and writing, longer activities in class, but maybe not so often because then your, your kids will just start to dread reading and writing because it just means sitting down for ages, All right? Okay, so when it comes then to sourcing materials for young learners, um, try to use visuals whenever possible, okay? Visuals are a win. Yeah, pictures, flashcards, drawings, etc. cetera, okay? Um, there's a lot of material online um, if you search. Um, don't assume that just because it's online that it's, it's correct or it's beneficial, okay? So read worksheets you find online thoroughly in advance. Um, you know, check for typos, check for level of difficulty, um, ensure that the content is age appropriate. Um, so yeah, don't, you know, when you're taking stuff from online, just preview it really thoroughly before you use it. And yeah, if you are designing your own materials and worksheets, keep images and font appealing and colorful. Okay, if it looks nice, they're more likely to pay attention to it. Um, try to use Realia as much as you can. Um, by realia, we mean real objects, okay? So if you're studying food, for example, um, you might bring in like a little bag of shopping, like you might bring in a banana, an apple, an orange, okay? Um, a packet of rice, etc. cetera. Um, you know, a real banana will be much more effective than a picture of a banana, okay? Um, now, not to say that you have to be lugging tons of stuff around with you all the time, you don't. But if it's something small and easy to carry, yeah, bring Realia. Um, your students will appreciate it. Um, as well as that, try to use videos and songs as much as you can. Okay, audiovisual means are amazing here. Um, always try to have extra activities as a backup. Yeah. Um, so of course you'd plan all of your tasks for the lesson. Yeah, but always over plan, always have just one or two more tasks just in case. Okay, um, if you're doing an activity and it's just not working, like the kids just aren't into it, you know, just cut and run. Okay, end that activity and do another one. Okay, um, so have those extra tasks up your sleeve. Um, mystery hats or mystery boxes are super fun with young learners. So, um, you know, if you're learning vocabulary, 
at the end of every class, ask them to write down, yeah, maybe one word each that they've learned. Okay, um, put that little slip of paper with the word in a box or a hat. And then at the beginning of the next class, you know, it's a nice little revision activity. Everybody can go pick out a word and then maybe, you know, um, maybe define it for their classmates to guess the word or, you know, mime the word for their classmates to guess. Um, you know, it's just a really nice revision activity. And as the days and the weeks go on, you know, you will have like so many words in your mystery box and hat for the for the kids to, to uh, you know, to be constantly revising. Um, that can be really, really fun. OK, um, just to finish up then, um, let's talk about the young learner teacher's role in the class. OK, what do you need to do um, as well as um, keeping all of the tasks coming? Um, well, you need to keep your teacher talking time very concise and very graded. Right. Um, keep it really, really simple. OK. Um, you know, that the more concise we can be when speaking to our students, the more likely they are to understand and the less likely they are to tune out. OK, um, this is especially important when it comes to instructions. Um, we've got to be really, really simple with our instructions. OK, um, look at the text, circle the words, underline the verbs or whatever. OK, just always imperative. Do this circle this, colour this, etc. Um, use exaggerated gestures and body language. Okay, young learners are just all about the expression. So even if in the beginning you find yourself, you know, you feel a bit silly, you know, doing everything so big, you know, push through. Kids love that. And with time, you will become so, so animated when you're teaching. Um, really importantly, just keep calm. Okay. Um, you know, some days are just sent to test us in the classroom, especially with young learners. Um, if you find yourself getting a bit, you know, stressed out or overwhelmed, just oh, deep breath. Yeah, just try to carry on. Try to uh, keep your own emotions um, under lock and key um, because kids tend to uh, tend to feed off the energy that we're giving out. Um, as I said before, try really hard to be flexible. OK, even though you've planned an amazing task, if the kids don't like it, yeah, just cut it short and move on. OK, um, you know, give it give them the chance to get engaged. But if they don't move on, OK, um, young learners will follow your lead. OK, so be upbeat, okay, positivity all the way. Yeah, that's what they will feed off. Um, have patience and then some more patience. OK, there is never enough patience in the world. OK, and above all, just have fun. OK, don't be scared of it. Don't be intimidated by young learners. OK, um, for sure, it's challenging. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. It can be challenging, but oh, it's so fun. Like you will never have a better time in the classroom than when things are going well with your young learners. OK, um, I promise you it's, it's some of the best times you'll ever have. OK. So they would be my words of wisdom <laughs> for teaching young learners. Um, now, I know that was a lot. That was a lot of, of information really quickly. Um, so I'm going to give you a moment or two to, to process. And uh, you can also start popping in your questions into the chat box. OK, and we will get through them as many as we, we will get through as many as we can. OK. So I'll give you 30 seconds or so to, uh, to process and then you can put in your questions. All right. In the meantime, I'll read your comments. OK. Oh, Geraldine, buried in snow. Wow. <laughs> I hope you're, you're keeping warm. Um, oh, hey, Carmel. Yeah, County Waterford. I'm in County Galway. So, you know, opposite ends of the country, but again, great to be on the same island as you. OK. Um, oh, hi, Judy. Thank you so much. All the best to you for the holidays. It's exciting, isn't it? 
Oh, I do love this time of year. All right, so let's see then. Um, let's take a look at some questions that are starting to come in. So, hey, Kaju, how are you doing? Lovely to see you again. Um, please, can you share some of the games that you play at the end of class? Oh, yeah, absolutely, Kaju. Um, so when it comes to games, um, I like to keep things really simple, OK? Um, with kids, I try not to play games that involve equipment <laughs> or that involve lots of little fiddly pieces of paper, OK? Um, the games I really love to play generally just involve um, the whiteboard, some markers, and then just, yeah, the kids themselves. Um, so I'm a massive fan of run and games, OK? Um, let me tell you why I call them run and. Um, so imagine we have spent um, the last week um, learning loads of vocabulary um, about food, OK? Hey, it's Christmas. I have food on the brain. Um, so you've learned loads of vocabulary about food. Um, so one thing I will do as a game, um, I will just write maybe 20 different words related to food all over the board. OK, um, all the words we study during the week. Um, then I will divide the kids into two teams or three, depending on the number in your classroom um, or in your class. Um, I line the kids up in their teams in front of the board and the, the kid at the front of each line will get a marker. OK, um, a different color marker for each team. OK, um, then I will call out a word. You know, if if the kids are just beginners, I might call out the actual word like banana. OK, um, then the first three kids at the head of each line will have to run to the board and try to be the first to circle the word banana. OK. Um, because they have different colored pens, you can you can see pretty easily who's got in there first. OK, um, if the kids are not beginners, if they have a little bit more um, language, I might make it more difficult by saying, OK, this thing is long and yellow. OK, um, and then they'll need to like scan all the words and try to run up and try to be the first to circle um, banana. OK, um, so. This is my run and circle. OK, um, just to vary it up a little, I also have a run and erase. OK, so each instead of um, giving them a marker, the kid at each at the head of each line will be given just a little tissue and uh, they'll have to run and try to be the first to erase, um, you know, the word that I'm describing. Um, there'll be loads of, you know, them erasing the wrong thing and you need to go up and rewrite the words, but that's absolutely fine. It doesn't matter. OK, um, I'm also a big fan of run and grab. Um, so instead of writing the words on the board, um, I'll put up flashcards with blue tack, OK, all over the board. And again, the kids at the front of the line will need to run up and try to be the first to grab the flashcard. OK. Um, that can tend to get a bit violent. <laughs> they start like pulling it off, trying to get it off each other and, you know, all, all manner of shenanigans, you can imagine. So you have to be pretty, pretty strict on that one. Like, oh, Sylvie, you touched it first. You get the card for your team. OK, um, if your kids are a bit more advanced, you can do run and write. OK. So again, um, you describe a word and they need to run up and try to be the first to write the word that you've been describing. Um, that can work really well with spelling games. OK, run and spell. Um, so tons of run and games. All right. Um, so just get your kids in a line. The first one, you know, the first ones in the line do whatever. Then when they're finished, they go to the back of the line. The next ones go, etc. cetera. OK, um, super, super fun. Um, other games I really like to play um, include categories. Um, I'm sure you've all played that game. Like you give your kids um, a little worksheet with different categories like country, food, color, job. Yeah, whatever, you know, whatever you've been studying, whatever area of vocabulary you've been studying. OK, then you put them into teams and um, you give them a letter. Like you say, OK, the letter is S. 
And then they need to try to race to be the first ones to get a word for each category beginning with that letter. Okay, when they have all of their categories complete with one word of the, the indicated letter, they shout stop and everybody else needs to put down their pen. Okay, then everybody reads out the words they have and they get one point for every, um, for every correct word they had. All right. Um, so they are just a couple of really, really, really simple games. Okay. As I think of more, I'll, uh, I'll tell you about them too. All right. So thank you, Keshi. Okay. Um, oh, I'm seeing lots of love for my sad face consequence. <laughs> uh, thank you, Kathy. Yeah, it's great. I mean, kids can see it. You know, you tell them stuff, it's in one ear out the other, but when they can see it like right there in front of them, there is no, there is no hiding <laughs> what they've done. Okay. Um, okay, Jennifer. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad you, you like the sad face. Um, yeah, it, it's super, super effective. Um, with, uh, if you're teaching older teens, like the 13 and up, yeah, you can like 13 to 16, maybe you can still use that system, but instead of a sad face, which is really childish, you can just do the traditional three strikes and you are out. Okay. So just like line, line, line. Yeah. Three strikes. You're right. All right. Good. Okay. Oh, Mervyn. Wow. This is a question. Okay. So first of all, hi, Mervyn. I haven't met you before. So it's lovely to see you. Um, what was the most challenging moment you have experienced in class? Oh gosh, Mervyn, so many. Um, the one that always comes to mind first is the time that I had, um, I had a class, like I had only been with them for about a week, so I didn't really know them yet. Um, but I had a class of 12 um, seven-year-olds, okay? Um, so, you know, I didn't really know their personalities yet. So I thought, okay, why don't we do something really fun um, like um, making, uh, making um, what was it? I think it was, it was some occasion anyway in Spain. Um, it was some occasion, what was it? Hmm. It must have been like some local saints day or something in October because yeah this was in October I remember it clearly um so I had all of the paper I had all of the nice child-friendly scissors all of the glue all of the glitter everything um and I had the kids at like three different tables okay and I had the tables quite far apart that was my mistake because I couldn't keep an eye on everybody <laughs> um I should have had the tables closer um, but I was helping one table with their cards and I turned around and lo and behold, at the table behind me, um, one little boy had taken his um, his scissors, his safety scissors, and he had cut a massive chunk of hair. <laughs> okay, He had had a fringe at the beginning of class, but he had like cut a huge chunk of hair, okay, right off his head. Um, so yeah. I turned around and I just saw a table covered in hair and a child with a very, very lopsided haircut. Um, my second mistake, I like legitimately screamed. <laughs> I overreacted a little. I was like, ah! And of course, all the kids turned, looked at him, all started laughing. And he, the boy loved the attention and he cut off more of his hair. Okay. So <laughs> it, it took me a minute. Okay. Um, I just said, okay, everybody, scissors down, pens down hands down <laughs> okay just stop moving stop screaming stop doing stuff okay and um then i just had to go out luckily my classroom um if when i opened the door in my classroom the secretary was with the receptionist was sitting like right outside so i just had to take this boy and just told the receptionist look can you just keep an eye on him for 10 minutes don't let him out any scissors <laughs> okay and please phone his parents and tell them what, have ha what has happened okay so yeah, that was probably my most challenging <laughs> moment in the classroom. Um, but you know, I could have done lots of things to prevent it though. Um, the main thing I should have done was arrange the tables so that I could see everybody. Okay. Um, because if you, you know, if you can't see what's going on, like for more than a minute or so, or if you don't look around enough to see what's happening, 
that's when stuff can happen. Okay, my second mistake was screaming and drawing attention to it. Okay, I should have just, you know, left the table I was at, gone over, yeah, quietly and said, okay, Juan, come with me. <laughs> yeah, I should have just removed him and dealt with it um, and not drawn attention to the fact that there was a, a bit of a disaster going on. All right. So, yeah, I learned a lot from that. I learned a lot from that. Just keep an eye on everyone and don't overreact and just keep it calm. Okay, so thank you, Mervyn, for bringing back that particular memory. Um, I had nightmares about it for, for many times after. All right, um, so Mena, I used to use don't do this and that, and I don't know why it doesn't work. Hmm. Thank you for that. Would you also say that using please a lot and giving instructions is not effective? Hmm. Interesting. Um, do you know, Mena, I am Irish, as you know, and in Ireland, we say please a lot. I know we do in every country. Everybody does, but Irish people are, yeah, quite big on the please. Um, so when it came to students, I actually did find that saying please too much kind of gave them the idea that, you know, it was a choice for them to do it or not. Okay, I was asking them, please do it. And they interpreted it as, okay, but if you don't, whatever. Okay, um, so yeah, I did remove please quite a lot. <laughs> from my instructions. Um, I found that it's really, really possible to be very polite and very positive without saying please. Yeah. So as I said before, when you're giving instructions or asking kids to do something, you know, just just tell them like, oh, hey, um, Maria, put that book on the table for me. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Maria. Yeah. Or Juan, um, it would really help me if, yeah, you give out these worksheets, okay? Or Juan, give out these worksheets, yeah? Thumbs up, smile, okay? Um, so, yeah, I find that, you know, while the odd please will always slip out, and there's nothing wrong with it, like, who knows? God knows there's nothing wrong with being polite, but I find young learners respond better to just do this, yeah? Like, it's an order, but you're giving it really nicely. And there's no ambiguity that that order might be optional to follow. Um, okay, so thank you, Mena, great question. Um, so Kathy, yeah, Kathy, it was a massive shock. <laughs> it, was, it was something else. Um, okay, uh, Mervyn, uh, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, did the parents, uh, did the student's parents understand about the child cutting his hair? Well, Mervyn, they weren't delighted, but they weren't surprised. Okay, so I should think that maybe, um, you know, they weren't they weren't incredibly shocked. <laughs> so perhaps um, this kid had form for doing stuff like that. But, you know, I explained the situation as best I could to them. I spoke to them, you know, after the class had finished and the kids had left. And yeah, they were you know, they weren't delighted about it, but but they were okay. They accepted it. All right. Um, so, Kaji, do you have any tips for encouraging self-conscious teens to join in with songs, physical activities? Hmm. Great question, Kaji. Um, teens are, yeah, very self-conscious, aren't they? Um, honestly, joining in with songs, I just, no, I gave that up, Kaji. Um, I just found that it's something they don't want to do. Okay, like they just won't do it. And the more you try to make them do it, the, the more um, embarrassed or the, the more um, obstinate they become. Um, so honestly, I wouldn't ask them to join in with the song. Um, you know, I'll always say that you can, you know, you know, please sing if you want. Yeah, I would use my please here because it's, it's optional. You know, sing if you want, but you don't have to. OK, um, sometimes they'll forget themselves and do it, but um, generally they won't. So, you know, pick your battles. If it's enough for them to like listen along to the song and maybe complete a worksheet as they go or, you know, maybe nod the head around. You know, but maybe don't make it obligatory. Um, with physical activities, um, it could be a bit different, like if it's a game, like a game of charades, maybe. Um, you know, we play charades a lot, like miming stuff. 
Um, I find that um, with with self-conscious teams, it works well if you don't do the games as a whole class. Like maybe you break them into teams or maybe you break them into small groups so that instead of like um, 15 people playing at once, you have like five groups of three. Um, with five groups of three, you know, there will be so many people doing so many things that nobody will be looking at any of the other teams, okay, because they'll be concentrating on their own team. Um, so, you know, doing activities like that in groups or in teams is much more effective because the, the self-conscious kids don't feel like they're being watched by everyone. Okay. Um, also, you know, if there's a if there's a teen or a kid, even any age, who don't really doesn't want to do an activity, okay, don't force them. You can tell them, um, okay, Maria, why don't you just sit here and watch? And if you feel ready or if you want to participate, yeah, you can. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of times they think that they won't enjoy it, but when they see everybody else doing it, then they want to. Uh, then they do want to join in. So maybe, yeah, just remove the pressure and they'll be more likely to participate. All right. Yeah, nice question, Katie. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's how I feel about sounds. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Me too. I, I was never a fan of the forced uh, singing. But uh, if given a chance, I would I would probably join in once everybody else had started. Okay. Um, Mena, yes, I use please a lot and then I find them not complying. I agree that maybe they might be thinking it's optional. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think like there are lots of ways to convey please without, you know, constantly saying please. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, I'm big on the thank yous. Okay, there will always be a thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you for helping me. Okay. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Because, yeah, that's that's just nice, isn't it? Um, I think in general, when it comes to praise um, with young learners and actually with adults, with any age, um, it's important that when we praise our students that we're praising something specific. OK, um, you know, if we're just throwing out empty, well done, great job, very good. Yeah, you know, that can just become, you know, part of the background noise, right? Um, you know, praising for no reason mm. it kind of takes away the the uh, the niceness of the praise. Um, so when you're praising your students, you know, make sure you say for what? Like, oh, Maria, I saw you sitting down quietly working really hard. OK, well done. Yeah. Or I was really happy to see you helping your classmate. Okay, thumbs up. Yeah. So try to uh, try to praise with intention <laughs> um, rather than empty praise. All right. Nice. Okay. Um, Mena, um, how do you motivate young learners in the classroom, and how do you motivate them in online class? Yeah. So. Um, as we said, Mena, just try to keep things moving. Yeah, try to keep things interactive and dynamic and fun. OK, um, you know, we want them to want to do our tasks. Yeah, because our tasks are purposeful, dynamic, um, entertaining. Yeah, um, it could be they're motivated because they know that there is going to be something fun at the end of class. There's going to be a game. Yeah. Um, you're going to sing a song, you're going to do whatever. Okay, so, you know, really, it's about playing the long game with them and just creating that atmosphere like that dynamic atmosphere um, to your lessons. So, you know, they know that even if, okay, now we're reading a worksheet and answering questions, and that's not the most fun thing, but I know that soon, <laughs> yeah, we're going to do something different. Yeah, and we're going to do something fun at some stage in the class. OK. Um, I know a lot of teachers use reward charts. OK. Um, and, you know, that can work depending on your class. So like at the end of the class, you know, you will give stars or draw 
you know, draw smiley faces or give stickers or something. Um, if you do go down that route, I would definitely say to keep your reward chart very, um, very behavior based or very effort based rather than outcome based. OK, because we don't want our reward chart, you know, to become about, you know, how um, how clever or how accurate or how fast somebody or how many answers somebody knows. OK, we do not want that under any circumstances. Um, instead, we want to focus on things like the effort the kid has made how well they have behaved, etc. Okay. Um, in online classes, I guess the same, you know, just by keeping up that, that pace, you know, changing tasks, um, praising their effort, yeah, praising intentionally. Yeah, you know, if they're in breakout rooms, pop into the breakout rooms, try to spend some time with them individually or in pairs of two, or in, in pairs of two, in groups of two or in pairs. Yeah, you know, just be there, just be present, let them know that you're you're paying attention to them and you're noticing what they do. All right. So thank you, Mena. Great question. Um, so Kathy, how do you determine what the expectation should be for how much they learn or how fast they should be progressing? Is that laid out in the school's curriculum? Will it come with experience? Oh yeah, Kathy, good question. Um this is generally a school thing okay so if for example you join a language school um, as an ESL teacher um, you'll probably have a course book to follow and the school will have their curriculum like um, okay week one um, you are going to cover pages um, two to five yeah of the course book okay you need to cover present simple adjectives and whatever OK, um, all of this should be in place for you so that you know what speed you can move through the book. Um, as an aside to that, whenever I do an interview with the school, yeah, and you know that bit where they ask you, do you have any questions? Uh, my question is always, do you have a curriculum and do you have a course book? OK, and if the answer to those questions is no, I do not work there. OK, um, because like you can't believe how hard it is and how stressful it is and how time consuming it is um, to have to make up your own stuff, your own material all the time. OK, so make sure you, you work for a school that has a curriculum and has a course book. Yeah. Then you can spend your time doing all of the fun, interesting extra material because you already have that base there. OK, um, with experience. Yeah. With experience, you definitely learn a lot about that. Like. There are things in course books and you start to notice like, oh, no, I'm not going to do that. OK, or I am going to do it, but I'm not going to use the book for it. OK, so, you know, with experience, you get the confidence to like digress a little from the book. So maybe you're still covering the same language point, but you're doing it differently. And that's that's fine generally. Yeah, as long as you're covering all of the, the areas in the curriculum, you're generally good to go. OK, so thank you, Kathy. All right. So let's see then. Um, so Mena, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was also a praiseaholic when I started. I thought that praise was the way to their hearts, um, but it wasn't. Yeah. But then it kind of was once once you get into the habit of like the really intentional, like praising like the, the the small stuff and the stuff you've seen. Yeah, that can really I can really motivate them. OK. Um. So, oh, my goodness, guys, we only have 30 seconds left. Wow. OK, let me do a quick um, run back through the comments and just make sure I haven't missed any sentences or any questions. Um, okay, I think we have everything. All right. Um, yeah, so that seems to be it, everyone. Um, thank you so much for keeping me company for the last hour. Um, it's always an absolute pleasure. Um, and hopefully we will see each other in the new year. Um, 
I know we have lots of really fun webinars um, lined up for, for January and February. So um, I'm really looking forward to seeing you all again. Um, as always, um, I am going to ask you to fill in our end of webinar survey. Yeah. Um, as you know, as teachers, we are always looking for feedback. OK, we're always looking for ways that uh, we can improve. Um, so it would be really, really great if you could take some time to um, fill in our survey. Um, I'll also post the link in the chat box now. OK, so I guess all that's left for me to do is to wish you all a really, really wonderful Christmas. Or holiday season, um, however you're going to celebrate it. Yeah, I hope you get in lots of really good food, lots of really good relaxation and that, uh, yeah, that you all have a wonderful new year. All right. So see you all soon, everybody. Bye.